um, if you've got any questions, put them, please put them in the chat. Um, Bex is going to um, uh, monitor those. Thanks to everyone who has contributed um, and you're on, the, you're on the screen at the moment. Um, and yeah, put your questions in the chat, but you're welcome to unmute and, and turn your um, video on if you want to ask a question in person. We're going to crack on through the webinar um, first and see how we go. So responsible use at learning time. Um, we're just going to cover where we come from. What does good practice look like on sheep farms at lambing time? What do we know in terms of um, antibiotics? What are our options? And um, we've got a number of um, practitioners who are going to share with us um, what they've done, how they're putting this into practice. So where have we come from? And um, this won't be news to most of you, but um, back as it's only in 2017 when um, in the vet record, uh, Edinburgh University students, 68% um, of farms where Edinburgh students went lambing were using prophylactic oral antibiotics, and 26% of those farms were using uh, prophylactic parental antibiotics. Um, similar time, we had a PhD, um, Eliana at Nottingham, who did a couple of surveys on um, 600 and then 400 and, um, 500 farms uh, supplying uh, retailer dead weight, um, supplying lambs dead weight, um, and a quarter of farms in 2016 were using oral spectinomycin on all their lambs, um, and about 20% the following year. I'm not sure that's not necessarily a reduction. Sometimes um, we wondered whether asking people the question and asking them again and knowing it was a retailer involved, whether people knew to answer that they were answering in a certain way, not necessarily that we'd reduced, um, we, we don't know. Um, but, and a lot of farmers, well, up to 10% were also using pills. So that's sort of a bit where we've come from. Um, back in 2016, there were 11 and a half million doses of um, oral antibiotics sold for lambs in the UK. We know we reduced that to about five and a half million by 2021. And then we know that we know there's been no authorized um, oral dosage of antibiotics. Um, there is nothing licensed or authorized um, since the end of last year. So I'm going to invite Rachel to um, let us know what their practice has done over the last um, four or five years. Thanks, Rachel. So um, we started to um, communicate um, this message about um, blanket antibiotic usage to our farmers back in probably 2018. So as soon as the rumour announcement on um, working towards reducing antibiotics in sheep farms was made, we um, started to think about how we're going to do this in our practice. Um, and we felt the main way was that we didn't want to just take the antibiotics away, we actually wanted to provide the farmers with um, a sustainable way that they could um, move forward and therefore use less antibiotics. So in 2018, in the autumn, we ran two client meetings, one on new nutrition um, and the other one on hygiene and colostrum around lambing time and risk-based antibiotic treatments. Both were really well attended and um, the room was full on both occasions. We repeated those in 2019 with a similar result. Then COVID came along and we couldn't do any until this year. So we've just done a U nutrition meeting in the last couple of weeks. Again, the room was full. So there's appetite from farmers to learn about these things. The other things that we did was um, we put a summary of both the meetings together in the practice newsletter to get a wider distribution to our clients. Um, so that um, it wasn't just the people who came to the meetings that um, had access to the information that we're talking about. And um, we also had a farm team meeting um, to discuss our antibiotic dispensing policy, at which time we decided that every farmer should have at least a phone conversation with a vet um, before any antibiotics were going to be dispensed for lambing. Although obviously we've got a lot of farmers on routine health visits and health plans. So if that conversation had been had recently during health planning, it could be adapted because we knew what had already been talked about on that farm. And then every time a farmer brings up wanting more medication, just have a little quick catch up. Uh, one of the vets chats to the farmers, 
make sure where they are, how many doses they've used, have they actually got a problem? Do we actually need to go and investigate something because they've got an outbreak? Or actually, is it all going okay and it's still within um, the boundaries that we'd set during that initial um, conversation? We did always decide that because our farmers have been very used to just turning up and asking for antibiotics and um, if there's someone there, they'd say yes and off they'd go again, that we could allow an emergency bottle of antibiotic to go out if uh, that was really necessary, but it would always be followed up with a telephone conversation as soon as possible afterwards. So, uh, yeah, we can go on um, to the next slide. So. This is just a little graph, it's just some paired data that I managed to pull out from our um, practice records um, showing our antibiotic usage um, in 2017. So this is antibiotic usage at lambing time, not spec time usage in particular. So it's just the lambing time spike. So it's penicillins and orals together in 2017 to 2021. And as you can see over that time, Every single farm has reduced their antibiotic usage at lambing time. Obviously, there's been blips along the way with outbreaks of disease and um, other problems. But overall, everyone has reduced and overall we've reduced our antibiotic usage by about 75% over the lambing period. Um, so we had a bit of an idea this year because we've got no spectrum. Um, and we're probably going to work with um, Trimox as our first line antibiotic um, for sheep farmers, um, that we're trying to work out the difference between injectables used in lambs and injectables used on ewes. Um, I tried it a bit last year, um, and we got farmers to mark a bottle of Trimox with an E when they opened it for ewes, um, and reserved another bottle for Mark with an L when they used it to lambs to try and help us just count out how many doses were going in use and how many doses were going in lambs. Now, that seemed the easiest way to simplify it. It's probably not perfect, and I'm sure sometimes they'd reach for the wrong bottle, uh, but I think it gave us some sort of a picture as to where those antibiotics were going. Brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so, um, Rachel's a good example of good practice um, in, in good practice in the practice. Um, so, and this is, and people will have seen this slide plenty of times before, but good practice actually on the farm or in the lambing shed and, um, and putting that around the plan, prevent, protect. So um, planning ahead. And that's why uh, this webinar is now at the beginning of December and not um, a week before lambing starts because like we're well aware that um, all of you guys in practice have very much got a plan ahead. But even on farms, talking with uh, farmers to get the forage away now to make sure we're sorting out what the nutrition is like um, for the ewes, um, for, for their plan, um, preventing any issues, um, poor hygiene, poor um, ventilation, uh, wet, um, mucky straw, um, preventing unnecessary issues and then protecting the flock. So protecting the ewes by vaccinating and make sure the correct body condition score and make sure they're having a well-balanced diet, but primarily protecting the lambs by making sure they've got decent colostrum um, into them. And uh, colostrum is goal will be of no surprise to many people here. And these tweets and various articles and things are from three, two, three, four years ago even. Now this has been, we have been talking about this for the last few years. If you've not come across Colostrum is Gold, then do um, Google it, go onto the Rumour website. There's masses of material there for um, encouraging farmers to be, uh, you know, making sure Colostrum is gold um, on their farms. And, and there's plenty of veterinary articles as well. Um, certainly last year, two, two years ago, we put BRICS refractometers on 147 Welsh farms, and um, we're always concerned that we don't get good data off farms. We got collected colostrum data, actual quality of colostrum off nearly 1,300 ewes. Um, and it's not, it's about 20 pounds for a BRICS refractometer. And actually put those in the hands of farmers and just to say, you can check how good the colostrum quality is. You know, we know it's not all just about quality, we know it's got to, they've got to, the lambs have got to get it into them. There's got to be enough of it. Um, 
and everything, but it just gave um, a number of farmers just something to work at and to, um, and part of it was just taking the focus away a bit from, do, can we, um, is there something practical we can do? And really the very best thing, as we're all very well aware, is making sure that colostrum is the first thing into a lamb and not some antibiotic. Um, so yeah, there's there's plenty out there to access. Um, uh, so would I de definitely encourage that. And if you're having farmers meetings, as Rachel spoke about, you nutrition meeting, um, now's the time to have it um, for sure. So I'm gonna go over to Jonathan who, um, uh, was quite an early, um, yeah, uh, at the early stage of this vanguard. Go ahead, go ahead, Jonathan. Um, so a bit like Rachel, um, we started having a discussion actually in spring 2018. So about this time, end of 2017 into 2018, um, trying to reduce, as uh, well, spectam, um, in lambs, and it's a really tricky thing to do. So. As vets, we're not the first line. If the client comes in, is used to phoning up and saying, can I have five bottles of Penstrep, three bottles of Spectan at lambing? And usually you just get an okay. And we decided that before any of those drugs went out and especially the Spectan, that we'd have a chat about how they were using it and why, um, and could they reduce their usage through all the things that Fiona's just discussed there. Um, and the key thing is to get the whole practice with you and to engage your farmers. Um, and initially that communication was quite tricky. Farmers, a lot of them thought that they wouldn't be able to have any um, and took that quite badly. And then once they had the discussion and we got on board with it, um, we, we made some progress. Um, but it's, it's quite important to realize that they're using this product because historically they very likely had a, a hideous outbreak lambs were dying um and then they've they've seen that they've used the product the problem's resolved and they're very very nervous to to reduce from that point um but it can be done we were fortunate that we started in 2018 uh, so we decided to take baby steps initially we said um you know don't do your singles and maybe when you get halfway through lambing and you're starting to get nervous and the shed's getting contaminated or maybe start throwing it in then and actually they realized they didn't really need it uh, and also in 2018 we had the beast from the east so about the worst time of year that you could start thinking about trying to make these changes so we had a small reduction of 14 percent of sales in first year and then significant changes um, year on year um, after that and we'd actually got to a point where our level was very justifiable, where I, I thought justifiable. So a bit disappointing it's gone. But um, a bit like Rachel, we're going to be um, using injectable amoxicillin as our, our go-to. Again, having the conversation as to how they need to be using it. Um, yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Um... I think in terms of what we do know, we know back in 2015, so this must have been a flock um, from the that 2015 lambing, if not the year before, that Emily um, and Michael Miller um, reported multi-drug resistant um, K99 E. coli infection. And, and on from that, there's been other studies, Jennifer's study, Jennifer from Liverpool, um, University of Liverpool, looked at susceptibility testing of E. coli recovered during lambing, um, and on some of those farms, you could see there's pretty high resistance to antibiotics. So as Jonathan said, people have started, started using antibiotics um, for E. coli infections for the right reasons. What we know probably happened is that they never stopped. I've certainly spoken to farmers who maybe started dosing every lamb 10, 15 years ago and no, and either they were too scared to stop or no one ever suggested that maybe they, they should. Um, so um, more up to date, so back in January uh, this, early this year, um, Rachel Collins and Amanda Carson from APHA, um, there's a good article in the record where they looked at um, uh, watery mouth as they, they took in lambs, affected lambs and tested them um, and, so and looked and saw that 
most of the E. coli were resistant to tetracyclines and then followed by ampicillin, streptomycin and um, spectinomycin. And that's reflected in the VARS report as well. So this VARS report was just published a month ago, um, uh, but that's data there from neonatal lamb, E. coli from neonatal lambs over the last three years. And um, again, we can see pretty high resistant levels to um, spectinomycin, streptomycin, ampicillin and um, tetracycline. It's worth just noting, so we are mainly talking about um, watery mouth at the moment, but um, another reason that often farmers are using antibiotics for um, at lambing time is for joint ill. Um, and we know that almost always streptoscalacti, which is a major cause of joint ill, um, is resistant to tetracycline. So injectable um, oxytetracycline is, is not um, a good choice for um, it in case of a joint ill issue for definite. And it, it may not be for E. coli. It can be um, farm specific, um, but it, there are high levels of resistance. It is worth, if you've got cases of watery mouth, then a charcoal swab is appropriate um, diagnostics um, to send to the lab. And I put up some of these um, slides from a farmers meeting just recently, and the farmers were absolutely amazed that um, this was quite a progressive group of sheep farmers at how um, that, that people were testing for drug resistance, for antimicrobial resistance, and were just like, why haven't we done that? How much does that cost? They couldn't, they, just to, to see that they could actually test um, the situation on their own farm. Um, it was a bit of an eye opener that they, they didn't realize that that was, that was available to them. So I'm going to go across to Gina, who's going to talk to us about um, what they've been doing at Cross Counties. Sorry, my mouse had gone to sleep. I couldn't unmute myself. Um, so, yeah, sort of similar to the, the guys before, um, we have been working um, with our farmers to try and reduce their spectinomycin um, usage over previous years. Every farmer that has rung up to order um, their spectam has been um, directed to a vet. There's been a discussion about how much they're using it, which lambs they're using it on, um, and sort of ways in which to reduce their usage and to just make them aware that, you know, sort of um, uh, mass sort of prophylactic treatment um, is, is not acceptable and trying to direct them to more appropriate treatment, which has meant that over the last few years, a lot of our farmers that maybe were using uh, Spectam on every lamb have already drastically reduced it. Um, last year, when obviously there was there was a, a shortage um, because it had gone out of production, um, everyone that was asking for Spectam um, got an information sheet uh, to sort of encourage them to tackle watery mouth in, in management ways. Um, we did still have some small supplies um, sort of left from previous years. We decided that the best way to manage this was to sort of equally distribute it amongst our farmers. So people were told that they could have one bottle um, to try and sort of um, wean them off it a little more gently rather than just ripping the carpet out from under their feet. But all of these people that were receiving um, the spectinomycin also got one of these information sheets um, and sort of further discussions as well. Um, we did decide um, that one particular farm, it was justified um, for us to prescribe an imported oral antibiotic. Uh, this farmer was having particular difficulties and a, before this was prescribed, a vet went out to the farm, walked through the farm with them, discussed everything that they were doing. And it was decided that in this situation that that was appropriate. We'll definitely be stepping away from that this year and, and we're not intending to, um, to import the, the oral um, sort of spectinomycin alternative. Um, we decided that we wouldn't openly discuss um, amoxicillin as an alternative. I think we were a little worried of um, farmers just jumping from an oral antibiotic to an injectable. And we more sort of gave them, like I said, um, sort of more management things to, to use instead and to encourage them to get in touch if they did have a problem. So we sort of hinted there were there were alternatives, there were things they could do, but we weren't quite so open about sort of directing to them that that to them straight away. Um, we didn't particularly endorse or encourage the use of any probiotics. Um, you know, we sort of just said there should be no harm in using them, but encouraged uh, 
correct usage. I think we were quite concerned about it being a fomite for, for carrying around bacteria, um, especially if things weren't being done hygienically. And if they'd been used to just putting a, a pump of antibiotic into the mouth of each lamb, <clears throat> They perhaps hadn't thought about um, the fact that, you know, a, a pump of a different sort or their fingers, etc., could be spreading bacteria amongst the lambs. Um, this year, you know, we're hoping the farmers will be even more prepared. Um, you know, everyone we spoke to last year were very much told that this would be the last year that they would there would be any uh, licensed oral antibiotic for them around lambing time. Um, and, you know, we sort of hope that we've laid the foundations to making this sort of transition away from it you know, easier this year. Um, and so these are just a couple of sort of testimonials. I won't read through them um, sort of completely, um, but, you know, the sort of the overriding uh, view and the, the sort of message from this is, you know, understandably farmers have been really concerned about it, especially those that were more reliant on the usage um, or uh, sort of, as Jonathan was saying before, if they've had, you know, sort of pretty traumatic past experiences with watery mouth, I can completely appreciate that it is quite concerning. You know, some of them, uh, this top one here, you know, we were filled with apprehension. Um, we didn't want all of our time and effort to be uh, to be wasted and our profits eaten into. Um, but actually, you know, they really improved their hygiene and they found that not only was there a benefit in terms of fewer lamb losses, even without um, the use of, of Spectam, uh, they actually said, you know, there were other benefits too. At the end of lambing, there was far less, you know, muck for us to move. Um, and we took real pride in, in the shed being very clean. Um, and, you know, the, the, the second one is very similar. Um, you know, a lot of worry, a lot of concern, but actually feeling much more positive now going forward, having had a pod positive experience last lambing, despite the lack of oral antibiotics. And actually they feel the changes they made then have, have put them in good stead to, to cope well this year. Brilliant, thanks Gina. And I think, um, Jonathan, have you got something to add about the losses when you made those quite dramatic reductions? Yeah, similar to Gina really. So we, we didn't have any increased losses. Um, and anecdotally, farmers reported improved performance as well in that lamb crop, probably because of a focus of ensuring they actually got decent colostrum into them and all the other you know, benefits focusing on health and hygiene from day dot. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. And thank you, Gina. Um, OK, so. We're aware that most people are joining us to say, right, what, what can we do, what can't we do if we do have to use antibiotics? And so we put this together as a kind of core rules. So we've spoken about colostrum, about you, nutrition, body condition score and hygiene at lambing. So we see that those are the fundamental, most important things. And then the next important thing is that um, these days, routine prophylaxis is not appropriate under any circumstances. So what routine prophylaxis means is um, uh, that you decide now that when lambing starts, you will use an antibiotic. That is not appropriate. It may be that you do need to use an antibiotic a few days a week or whatever into lambing, but you cannot say now whether you need to be using antibiotics. And that goes for both watery mouth or joint till. There is no farm that needs to decide now that they will start using antibiotics in every lamb. That's not appropriate. Now, targeted metaphylaxis may well be appropriate um, when there's a clearly identified need. And to decide what to use for um, either for um, treating clinical issues or for targeted metaphylaxis, the Sheep Vet Society um, Sheep Antibiotic Guiding Group guidance that we put together, we updated it in March last year. I've made a short URL for you to access that. It's You can access it via the Sheep Vet Society website, um, but because it was back in March, it's a bit of getting to, the URL takes you straight there and you just click through to the PDF. Um, any antibiotic um, must be administered as on the data sheet. So it is totally not appropriate to give an injectable antibiotic orally. Um, and, and then the AMEC categorization is, is important. We'll go on to this in, in the next slide. So there's a, there's a couple of links there. Um, we've run these slides past the BMD, what we can say and what we can't say. And the cascade is really important. So um, as vets, we're 
we are fantastically privileged to, to be able to use a cascade, but it should be on a case by case basis. And a special import certificate is only, um, is only appropriate in exceptional circumstances. So if you know there is not a suitable authorised medicine, then you can use another medicine on the cascade or you may be able to import a medicine. So we do have those privileges. Um, in the guidance, we, um, just to summarise, um, so watery mouth is a bacterial overgrowth um, and endotoxemia um, in lambs have been deprived of colostrum. So for clinical cases, it may be that a parental antibiotic is more applicable. Um, and that's the case because they're, sept they're endotoxic and septicemic. In terms of metaphylaxis, it may be that people prefer an oral formulation, but there's pretty limited evidence on that. So um, those are the exact words and, and Bex will, <laughs> we spend a long time <laughs> agonizing over the exact words. There isn't a huge amount of, um, of information, but but that's kind of those are the wordings we came up with. Um, we did talk about E. coli um, vaccines and we talked about probiotics. We'll come back to those later. At the moment, we're talking about antibiotics. And Rachel, bless her, has put together this brilliant summary of the Sheep Vet Society um, Sheep Antibiotic Group guidance and work from the top and in classic traffic light <laughs> style, um, we, we, we need to look at the, um, the class of antibiotic and whether it's a category, so category D should be your first line approach. Uh, if, if there is not a suitable category D, you can go to a category C and the ones in red are absolutely stop. Do not, please do not use um, the, the categories in the red. And I think in the guidance, we put exceptional circumstances and that's for the HPCIAs. The gentamicin, tropomycin and um, amicacin, they are only a category C, but they are reserved in the UK. We do not have them licensed for food producing animals. They're reserved for um, uh, meningitis and serious infections in humans. So um, uh, we, don't want to, we don't want to use anything in the red and, and the antibiotic tablets authorised for small animals, um, do not have a licence for food producing animals. Um, actually, I know historically sheep vets got quite used to using small animal tablets for sheep. I actually think if you spoke to a member of the general public and said, oh yeah, we just use dog tablets for sheep. No, they're not meant to be used them in sheep, but they're, they're meant for dogs, but we just give them to sheep. It's fine. It's not licensed. You know, people would be absolutely horrified um, and I think we should be horrified as well. So they're not licensed in food producing animals. Um, so uh, it's not acceptable to use an, a, a companion animal tablet. So uh, I suppose it'd be fair enough to start with the green. So all the group D light, antibiotics licensed for sheep um, in the UK have to be given as an in, injectable. Um, now, as we've already said, some people would prefer to use an oral and some vets have, have said they would prefer to do that because they can keep track on it a bit more, what's used for watery mouth. Um, do you want to comment on that here, Jonathan? Do you want to jump in or not? <laughs> I can do. Um, yeah, so I can see the benefit potentially of importing oral spectinomycin because that product will only be used specifically for neonatal lambs so if you're in the where we are as a practice and Gina and Rachel of monitoring use that will allow you to monitor the use and metaphylaxis or prophylaxis thereof as soon as you start going down the parental route of half a mil in a lamb it's going to become pretty tricky to start monitoring that that use um that would be my only comment about perhaps whether it's okay to start looking at parental uh sorry oral antibiotics when we first put the guidance together we were aware that people would really want to use oral um products and 
um, which is why I went into quite a lot of detail. And although we haven't got the product names here, um, I think people are aware where they can get hold of things. There's, there's issues with everything and it may be pack size, it may be powders that have to be mixed up. A lot of vets are a bit nervous about that sort of thing. Um, but certainly, if you can work down through the green to the yellow, we, we are not planning on this webinar, apart from to say, please don't use the ones in red, is actually, it is your prerogative as a, a vet, you make a professional judgment. And, and if you can justify using all of the good reasons for, and, and Jonathan's comment there about people want to track it. And that's why I've had other vets say to me, they really want to use an oral dose so they can track that. And if they give out a bottle of moxicillin, um, it, it could go into use or labs. So I really like Rachel's idea of putting an E on if they're going to use it in use and an L in labs. Rachel has really trained her clients well. <laughs> well um, I don't know. If other people have got um, comments, uh, please do um, jump in. If anyone in our group um, who put this together wants to comment, if, if I've forgotten anything, please. I am. Um... I completely agree with what Jonathan's saying, that it certainly is going to be a more sensible way of, of monitoring usage and an easier way of monitoring usage because it, you know, as you were saying, it can't be used for anything else. I do think we need to be careful not to um, sort of make it almost too easy just for farmers to jump from one product to another. I think in some respects, um, the loss of the oral spectinomycin has been a helpful sort of push for some vets and some farmers to really um, think about the antibiotics they're using around lambing. And I think if we give something that's basically the same, but a different color, um, to, it just gives them the opportunity to continue doing as they were doing without too much thought. And obviously, you know, if it's done in the right way, actually it can be quite a good um, way of sort of gently weaning farmers off it if it's something that they, they have been very reliant on. But I would be cautious that we're not offering something that seems to be a, a complete direct alternative when actually you know it is imported it is off license and we don't want to encourage people to to con you know to think that it's perfectly acceptable to continue it, to continue using it in the manner in which they perhaps were before. Yeah, thanks, Gina. That's helpful. And certainly uh, from a that that was really the point of putting these in order is that, um, yeah, um, even, even then you don't want to turn you don't want to turn to one of the green ones and use it without some thought. But um, but yes, you have to think about it a bit more carefully as you go on down to the orange and, and be able to justify it. Um, either if it's being used on the cascade or it's um, being or if you're trying to import it and it has to be on a case to case basis, case by case basis. And just a quick point, Fiona, on those ones in the red, Thomas in the chat has brought up that he knows of um, people not in the UK um, using enrofloxacin in lambs. And I think when we talk about exceptional um, circumstances to use those red ones, what we're talking about is evidence from results of in vitro sensitivity testing that no other antibiotic in the orange or the green category would be appropriate. So that's the level of evidence that would be required to use those in, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I agree. And certainly as an industry, um, we use very little of the HPCIAs in the sheep industry and we're quite proud of that. There, there are definitely people who would like us to not use any at all. Um, and yeah, um, I think if we can stick together on that, we have got a pretty good, um, a pretty good range of ones to go at. But um, yeah, exceptional circumstances means definitely diagnostics, um, testing, and sensitivity. Okie doke. We I will we'll come back to this table and put it up again at the end. If anyone's got any questions, um, ask away. Otherwise, I'm going to go over to. Kate and ask you to let us know what you did at West Bar. Thank you. Yes. Um, similar to the other um, participants, um, we've been working progressively with our sheep clients over the last few years to try and reduce the use of prophylactic antibiotics um, used in neonatal lambs. So this has been via various means, including items included on um, newsletters, which are sent via email and post promoting the hashtag 
colostrum is gold from AHDB at lambing time in particular, but especially in-person meetings um, for red tractor accreditation and face-to-face -face conversations on farm um, or at the practice discussing lambing supplies pre-lambing. Uh, backed up with phone calls and um, which just come in and give opportunities for giving advice. So progress has been made and with many of our farmers successfully not using any prophylactic antibiotics in lambs. Particularly last year, and this time last year, we arranged uh, farmers meetings. We run a flock health club which has quarterly meetings and this was one of those but open to non-flock health club clients as well. We also decided to invite one of our local um, young farmer clubs with lots of uh, young members often involved at lambing time either at home or doing placements um, from university positions um, and we had very good turnout. We covered um, antibiotic resistance, um, new nutrition, production and properties of colostrum and during which we gave a refractometer demonstration, thinking particularly for um, lambing students doing placements, it'd be a good idea for them to get involved with colostrum measurements. Uh, and we um, ended up with a piece on joint hill. The elephant in the room was the cessation of introduction of SPECTAM, and that was addressed during our question time and with individuals following the meeting. Uh, we uh, had quite a small SPECTAM allocation as a practice and our practice policy this time last year was that we had decided that we would not be offering an oral alternative and just had the few bottles that we'd been allocated. And there, there was going to be um, a parental choice that would be discussed with each farmer as they contacted us pre lambing and that was going to be injectable amoxicillin or injectable oxytetracycline, both licensed for sheep and both in the group D. So along with discussions about the choice of an antibiotic, if that was um, going to be dispensed, we would also be having conversations about risk assessing both each ewe and each lamb. And uh, felt that it was very important that no treatments should be started from the beginning of lambing, that that would be reiterated. There would always be a trial period before starting any treatments, even if that was just for a few days before the prophylactic antibiotics were started. When we dispensed any products for lambing, um, we had a practice colostrum and hygiene fact sheet, which was tucked into every order. Um, and uh, if there wasn't a, a vet available when that order was picked up, at least that, that information would be handed over by the receptionist. So this year, continuing in the same vein, um, we do feel that we've made progress and we'd be reiterating all these messages in a similar way, updating newsletters and fact sheets. Um, and particularly, I feel that we now will be having very targeted discussions with certain flock owners and that the one to one discussions are going to be the way forward this year. To getting improvements, having built up good relations with the farmers and they hopefully will feel that um, the advice is tailored to them, to them particularly and that they have confidence in what we are advising them. Brilliant, thanks Kate and that um, actually in any discussions we've had as we've been preparing this webinar it's the farmer communication um, communication within the practice and communication with our clients has really come out and that that came out very strongly in, in what you said there Kate so thank you very much okay I'm just going to go I said I'll come back to this and I'll just mention it we'll go through it quite quickly whether um, E. coli vaccines are available and also there's a the bovine concentrated lactoserum um, locatim um, off license um, so in the in the document we said very commendable, but we, we weren't aware of efficacy studies. Certainly the E. coli vaccine 
is not widely available. It's not licensed in this country. It would have to be under an SIC. Um, there are some, there are stocks available in Ireland. And um, I spoke to Merlin earlier in the week. They, they would be able to import it. Um, I only know of anecdotal evidence, apart from some papers back in the 1980s. Um, there is anecdotal evidence. Certainly JP at, at Larkmead has done um, some work and um, there was a paper at SDS in 2018, although I'm afraid I can't find it in the proceedings. So um, uh, a guy in Ireland spoke about the E. coli vaccine. So it is available if people want to use it. If other people have got any um, uh, evidence or um, reports that they've, uh, good reports, then, then please do let us know. Um, and then the Locketim, uh, it's, uh, you've probably seen 60 mil bottles available for calves. There is some data from Switzerland. Um, again, JP has used this on some of his with some of his clients with some success um, at a dose rate of between two and six mils per lamb. Under the cascade, it is very expensive. I don't know if anyone's got anything else they want to add to that. Um, uh, it's quite scant evidence. Um, whilst we're on the topic of scant evidence, We've tried to evaluate some of the non-antibiotic treatments. Um, we looked at one of the liquid probiotics on um, some Welsh sheep farms, uh, some work did with Kate Phillips' uh, lambing just gone. Um, uh, and they, uh, there was no water mouth on any of the farms, so it was quite difficult <laughs> to evaluate it. We did measure daily live weight gain up to six, eight weeks old, and there was no difference between treated and non-treated lambs. But as I say, um, generally there was very little disease on those farms. Um, and we also, there is a, a tablet that, an enzyme tablet that was marketed quite um, widely over the last um, few years. And people have been asking, is there any evidence? I don't know of any good evidence. Uh, what we got was quite poorly recorded and fairly low power. So we, we did have a thousand lambs treated and a thousand lambs not treated, but the farms involved did not um, strictly treat every other lamb. And so um, there is potentially bias in some of the results, but certainly what we could say on those farms, there were farms where the, tab the lambs who got a tablet um, had lower levels of washing mouth and lambs that did not get a tablet but there was also the opposite effect on a farm where um, there was definitely more washing mouth in the lambs given a tablet than the ones that did not um, and but so I have to say <laughs> I'm sad to say that even having tried to get the evidence um, we, we don't have a huge amount to go on there so I'm not going to dwell on it I'll just say that really we don't have good evidence. There's a lot of anecdote out there, but I still don't have good evidence on non-antibiotic treatments. What we did take from this study, out of these six farms, all these farms were recruited because they said, we have more than 10% water your mouth every year. And you can quite clearly see that some of them literally did not have any cases. Um, and it just made me realise that the perception of water your mouth, the fear of it is probably more than the actualness. And uh, certainly a uh, webinar uh, back January, uh, nearly two years ago now, with uh, 125 Welsh farmers lambing quite large numbers of ewes. Out of those, about a quarter of the farmers were most worried about water your mouth um, and about a quarter were most worried about joint till in their lambs. But when you actually ask them how, what the levels of water your mouth they were getting, um, 25% of those farms saw none at all. A further 44% saw water mouth in less than 1% of their lambs. So take these two um, figures together, 69% of farmers, nearly 70% of farmers had less than 1% of lambs. And, and there were plenty of those farmers who were justifying treating every single lamb on the farm. So th this is my argument for really, we, we cannot justify prophylactic treatment when actually it's low lum numbers of lambs. So um, actually um, getting ill. Now that's, um, you know, that 
there's there's all there is also joint till and and we still we can't justify using prophylactic lamb um antibiotics and joint till we may need to go in and use metaphylactic um joint till but that is a totally different veterinary question if we're using antibiotic as a clinical issue or um whether we're using it in advance for um uh for, prof for as prophylastics so I'm just going to, we've got, I know we've got questions and we'll come back to those. I do just want to remind people um, about Farm Vet Champions if you haven't heard about it or if you haven't signed up. Um, and also I'm well aware people who've spoken today have spoken about the journey that they've been on and some, there's some brilliant stuff going on and you guys, um, anyone else who hasn't spoken may also have some good cases. There are the Antimicrobial Stewardship Awards um, please do go on to the um, RCS Knowledge website and have a look at that. So the closing date is the 13th of January. We really, really want to hear about people who are doing good things, who've got good case studies, who've, you know, who can just tell us what you're doing and just encourage, you know, we can share those stories and encourage each other. So if you have got a good story to tell, um, please do go to the Antimicrobial Stewardship Awards. Um, those are in farm, equine and companion animals. So it may be some of your colleagues, let them know about it. And um, just whilst we're on the RSVS Knowledge site, if you, if you haven't had enough from this webinar talking about um, use of prophylactic antibiotics in lambs, uh, Emily recorded a podcast, Emily Gascoigne recorded a, a podcast with me back in the summer about what their practice have been doing over the last um, few years. Um, and it's quite inspiring to hear about gauging better with sheep farmers around lambing time. So um, there's uh, a podcast there to listen to, or um, otherwise uh, Rose Willis has also done a brilliant podcast just recently about uploading um, uh, data onto the Medicine Hub. So um, please do have a look at that and um, it's really worth looking at. We really, really, really need better data on cattle and sheep farms. And the only way we can get that nationally is to be putting um, data into the Medicine Hub. So you may have seen in the last week, uh, all the CEOs of all the retailers and um, processors and um, all the companies who um, are part of the Food Initiative on Antibiotics, FOIA, they all signed a letter to say, we should be doing this as a country, all our ruminant um, to preserve our, our trading possibilities um, for cattle and sheep meat. So please, if your clients are not signing up to the medicine book, um, medicine hub, please get them to. Um, right, I'm going to go back to this because I think this is probably where we're gonna have the most questions. And Bex, hopefully you've been keeping an eye on the chat and you're gonna yeah, thanks, Fiona. We've got a few questions. If other people want to add questions, it's not too late to add questions to the chat. Um, a few of the questions have been based on nutrition and colostrum, which is great because these are the foundations that we want everyone to pay attention to. Um, Joe's asked for um, alternatives to soya. If anyone's got any wise words on alternatives to soya for feeding using late pregnancy, um, put that in the chat or put your microphone on and wave your hand. And Dawn had a question, which actually, Fiona, you might be best able to answer on the practicalities of colostrum refractometry in, ca in case of you know, how much do you strip from the U before you put the drop on the refractometer? Are you going to get spurious readings if you do it just with one drop? Do you need to do, you know, how do you do it practically to make sure you're getting a representative sample to assess colostrum quality? Oh, no, that's quite interesting. So um, we've out of, I mean, we had a lot of different farmers testing colostrum qualities. So maybe a, a couple of strips. The but I would there wasn't any difference in um, in timings. And actually, Philippa took a load of samples where she she tested some immediately and she tested some after six hours and she and and there wasn't a huge difference. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. I would I do find if you have that really waxy colostrum where they possibly haven't. There isn't enough quantity there that's like really thick and waxy um those they're definite problems difficulty to strip we definitely had poorer quality if it's difficult to strip that was um uh significant for poorer colostrum quality but um uh i would have said if you just um 
yeah, uh, uh, we don't have too much of a problem with, with that. We did have a lot of colostrum that was way over the top of the refractometer. So often it was over 32%. And, um, and that really throws a few people because they're just getting a blank screen. They think their refractometer is not working and they just need to dilute it down or just test it with a bit of milk out of the fridge. You know, out of your cup, before you put it in your cup of tea, test a bit of milk and make sure your refractometer is giving a reading. I would say that's quite important. In terms of yeah. other proteins, um, I can have a conversation with that, are you about that, Joe? So we've used quite a few different uh, proteins and we're doing another test on a farm this year where not using soya, but using um, Nova Pro and, or some of the um, rape meal. I don't actually think DUP is quite as important as everyone always said, as long as you've got your effective room and degradable ERDP balanced with our with your fermentable energy I think that's more important than good bypass protein in soya so I'm, I'm not nearly so wound up about soya as I think I was five years ago if that's any help thanks Fiona I think that pretty much answers all the chat all the chat questions at the moment Dawn if you're not happy with that answer put something in the chat um Dawn was concerned about the fact that she had an actual case where um the ZSTs didn't really correlate with what they were being shown by the colostrum refractometry. And I guess the other thing to point out is that, um, you know, you can always do some total protein albumin bloods on the ewes earlier than lambs are obviously hitting the ground um, to assess your ewe protein nutrition as well. I didn't mean to just stop sharing the screen. I put that back up. I promised everyone it would be there. <laughs> Uh, is that all the questions then, Rebecca? That is all the questions, unless we've got another one that's just been added. Hang on. What oh, cutoff what? are you using for total proteins in lambs? Oh, that's a million dollar question. And we've had yeah. a huge debate with um, somebody in France at the moment. Um, yeah, we're just, <laughs> um, I don't think we, I don't think I know, although they've done a lot of work in France about that. Um, and we, I could dig out some of the discussion. I couldn't give you the answer on, the, on here. Someone else may be able to. Any thoughts and evidence on the use of cow colostrum? I was always a bit snooty about cow colostrum because it's um, lower protein. It's actually higher immunoglobulins. So if you're, I would say if your primary reason is you've got outside lambing and you need energy you do need a bit extra cow colostrum if you're there for the primarily for the immunoglobulins which i think we probably are i don't think we do need more cow colostrum than new colostrum um but um i don't think we have definite evidence uh, and there's also the the anemia issue so making, yeah making sure that you pull colostrum from several cows to reduce the risk of anemia yeah has anyone tried using zeolite to manage lambing shed bedding that's have to be a question to the audience i not anyone else can talk about zeolite and then there's a question here about thoughts on colostrum pastes so i can't comment about a colostrum paste i can certainly comment on all the artificial colostrums of which there are there was a report just just a year ago in the vet record comparing a number of the um powder colostrums even the very best powder colostrum is only ever half as good as a used own colostrum i always always try and persuade farmers to be harvesting colostrum off use rather than using powder. I don't know what other people think about that. Golly, these questions are coming thick and fast because I can't go down them quick enough. Um, Sources of information for farmer talks on new nutrition. Um, I guess AHDB and the feeding the U the feeding um, you, but the would, age would be the absolute that that's what I always use when I'm talking to farmers about nutrition. Um 
I can't think of any sort of pre-made PowerPoint presentations particularly that you can access, but it's it's all in there. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there was two, did they not do two webinars on feeding the you? Yeah, they may be on YouTube if you search I for them, you could are. always use those, yeah. Um, Hannah asks about, uh, I would say yes, a rectal swab from effective lambs for bacteriology and culture and charcoal swab. Um, yeah, I would say um, intestinal contents, preferably if you're taking them for, from post-mortems. But yeah, you can you can use a faecal sample or a rectal swab, certainly. Charcoal swabs or, or swabs in media because basically they stop them from desiccating on the way to the lab. So they're better. So any swab in media is better than a dry swab for bacteriology. Charcoal swabs would be fine. Brilliant, thanks. Sharminda Shaman, is saying she uses cow colostrum um, in the first 24 hours to top up empty or not full lambs, but she always gives you colostrum for the first one or two feeds. That's really helpful. Thanks, Sharminda. And um, Catherine says about you milk or colostrum, um, really good um, for the volumes, better than you's. Um, and and go and goat sorry goat milk is um, goat colostrum is about halfway between um, sheep and cow in so um, Sharminda's use maestral powder not zeolite and they do use maestral powder for loads of your clients and presumably with success Sharminda otherwise you want to put it in I imagine. And somebody, Hillary's asking if anyone's got any experience of a, a prevention of rotavirus outbreaks. Um, if they can, Joe's got his hand up. Do you want to speak, Joe? Um, yeah, is that, it's not about that. It's about switching sheep to outdoor lambing, which we've done a fair bit of. And I think that's probably one of the best ways of sorting it. It sorts the nutrition out and the hygiene issue and it reduces the reliance on labour. So it's a sort of win, win, win. Um, to have those conversations with farmers about why are they lambing inside and can they lamb outside a bit later or, you know. And a lot of farmers are pretty receptive at the moment with the fact their single farm payments are being reduced to actually lowering the costs of their business. So first steps, they might just lamb the twins out and leave the triplets and singles inside and things like that just while they get confident at it. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Joe. That's really helpful. And certainly Emily, uh, Emily, the other day was talking that um, flock I put up from 2015, where they had multi resistant E. coli, that flock has been lambing outside ever since, um, because they can't lamb inside. But um, better to better to move outside before you before you have to because you because you haven't, you've got multi resistance. Um, Pam asks if Lifeline or Megastart type blocks to promote colostrum quality for 10 to 24 days before lambing, and if not, why not? I, do, I personally don't like blocks, Pam, because of the quantity of, uh, I always think energy is really important for the last six weeks, but protein is so important for the last two weeks. And um, I don't think it's a particularly cost effective way of getting either energy or protein into them but um but i'm prepared to argue <laughs> if you want i guess it depends on your management system and yeah and lots of other things but broadly i agree yeah you'd be surprised how few farmers do any sort of forage analysis i'd start with that to be honest even if you're not doing bloods pre-lambing just start off with a forage analysis and they'll suddenly realize Oh, do I need to buy this cake? Do I need to pull these blocks out? Again, as Joe said, the cost of production and everything, it, it's just a bit of a no-brainer, really. You scan sheep and then you don't know what you're feeding. So. Judith says, just be careful with colostrum supplementation and what you use with accredited flocks. That's a big... Um, are you talking about taking colostrum from use or you're talking about powdered that's not accredited, Judith? Uh, sure. Yeah, uh, both actually. If you um, get colostrum from someone else and they're not accredited, things like that, uh, and or goats that aren't accredited, just don't mix and match. Very good point. That's really good advice, Judith, yeah. 
thank you. Yep. Um, Heidi, cluster means quantity and quality, decent follow up after the first 24 hours, essential. Use a shopping bag and a cheap set of scales for weighing suitcases or fish or lambs. <laughs> Thanks, Heidi. Okay. Well, I think, unless anyone's got any final comments, um, we've nicely um, moved off antibiotics and we're talking about colostrum, so that's brilliant, and feeding the ewes and all those things which um, are like at the top of our list of core rules. So um, I think that's a good success. Um, if what we've will, we've recorded this, we will put it on YouTube and um, we'll send a link to everyone who registered. Um, we're well aware we've probably got half the people here now who actually res registered, um, or if not less. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, make sure if you're doing anything good that you, you send a case report in or put it forward for a, a, an award, that'd be brilliant. Um, or just let us know what you're doing. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Yep. Thank you to everyone who contributed.